amount of energy and air and oxygen that has been sucked up. Not to say that what's going on in Brussels isn't terrible and we shouldn't be uh, pay attention to it. But more people died in the last week at the hands of drugs and heroin than terrorist attacks here in the States, and yet nobody seems to talk about it. Our next guest has written a story that is uh, must-need, must-read. It's uh, in Harper's. It's in the April uh, 2016 edition of Harper's. Pick it up at a newsstand if you know where one is or find it online, buy it online, whatever you have to do. Dan Baum with us. Dan, welcome to Big 550 KTRS. Thank you very much for having me. Tell the story about... In 1994, when you talked with yeah. former presidential man John Ehrlichman. Yes. Now, I, I was in high school when Watergate was going on. And for me, John Ehrlichman was the great Satan. He was one of the genuine villains of American history. Uh, but I was at the time working on a book about the, the, how drugs were turned into a weapon, a political weapon, a book about drug policy. Actually, in truth, I was not yet working on a book about how drugs were turned into political weapon. It was Ehrlichman who, who changed me on this. I was just working on a book about drug policy. Uh, it was going to be crit critical of the war on drugs. Ehrlichman had been one of Nixon's chief domestic policy advisors. I tracked him down to an engineering firm in Atlanta where he was doing minority recruiting. He'd gotten very fat. He had an enormous beard. He looked nothing like he had during Watergate. But this was John Ehrlichman. It was like, sure. it was a big deal for me to be sitting down with John Ehrlichman. And I started asking him these earnest, wonky questions about drug policy. And he stopped me and he said, can we, can we cut the, the BS here? Can I just tell you what this was all about? And he said it in this way. I mean, he'd been to federal prison. He'd been publicly disgraced. He, was, he said it in this way of a man who had nothing left to protect. And... He said, look, the Nixon campaign in 68 and the Nixon White House had two enemies, black people and the anti-war left. And he said, we knew we needed a way to project the police into their communities, to round up their leaders, to break up their meetings, and most of all, to vilify them night after night on the evening news. And we thought, if we can associate heroin with black people in the public mind and marijuana with the hippies this will be perfect and he looked me in the eye and he said did we know we were lying about the drugs of course we did and i got to tell you this interview it not only changed the book i wrote um it changed it changed my career ever since i've been working differently ever since because this interview told me if you get people far enough away from the events they're describing when they no longer have a dog in the fight especially if they have done bad things, they, they want to talk about it. They want to get it off their chest. And Ehrlichman, I think he was glad that somebody finally gave him the chance to apologize, basically. It's what he was doing. He was saying, of course we knew we were lying. What's interesting about, about Dan, uh, Dan Baum with us, writer for Harper's Magazine, he wrote an article called Legalize It, How We Win the War on Drugs. What strikes me fascinating about this, it's one thing to have a policy with unintended consequences going after the blacks and the hippies. It's another thing to specifically say we're going to invent a war on drugs to go after blacks and hippies. Hey, man. The war on drugs has always been more about war than about drugs. We have been using drug laws to go after ethnic groups we don't like since 1912, since the opium laws, the first, op the first drug laws in America, the opium laws in San Francisco. Uh, you go back and look at, at um, uh, the 1930s, there were Southern legislators warning of a wave of, this is a quote, <laughs> tokenized Negroes who were going to threaten white Southern womanhood. Um, they would talk about, uh, legislators would talk about Mexican, quote, beet peons, B-E-E-T, peons, smoking marijuana. Uh, if you can associate an ethnic group with some substance that makes them feel good, you can, you can demonize them. And you can project the police into their communities, and you can keep them rocked back on their heels as long as you want. You and we still do it. And i got to say, Nixon was a Republican. Ehrlichman was a Republican. But as my book demonstrates, 
the drug war has been equally useful to Democrats, that, that neither, neither party can wash its hands of this one. And f- quite frankly, it's not just the political parties. All of us have benefited from the drug war. If you are a parent who's going through a divorce and you work really hard and you, um, you, know, you, you may not be the most attentive parent and your kid is all screwed up, it is much easier to blame marijuana than it is to examine your own failings. Um, we all do this, and we have all done it. We have all participated in it. And what's encouraging is finally the bill has, be- has grown so big that the mainstream is starting to see it, that this, this really this isn't worth it. So you say in your, in your article in Harper's, and, and it's the first time anyone ever either explained it to me or sort of I understood it finally. You explain the difference between the drug addict and the effects of the drugs. And that society society is not affected by drugs. We're affected by the drug addicts. Or, well, or ex- explain that because the, the way you explained it in your article I was fascinating. Well... I, most of what we hate and fear about drugs is not the drugs. It's the effect of the enforcement against the drugs, the crime, the, the addicts lying in the gutters, um, the, the, the pushers trying to sell drugs to our kids. That's, those are all artifacts of prohibition. If, if we looked at these psychotropic substances as a health issue, um, we would handle them much differently. Um, it has become normal to think of these as a law enforcement issue. It doesn't doesn't have to be that way. Um, it is uh, it it is it is not worth. It. We are now understanding it is not worth it. That the that the benefits we derive from treating this as a law enforcement problem outweigh are, uh, um, are outweighed by the negatives. Um, you know, our drug problem. A lot of Americans use drugs. Very few become dependent on them. Now, when somebody becomes dependent on drugs, it is tragic. It is tragic for that person. It is tragic for that person's family and friends. It is an ugly scene, and I am not minimizing that by any means. These are dangerous substances that absolutely need to be kept away from kids, and, and it, is, it is a terrible thing when even an adult falls under dependence on any of these substances. But that is really rare in the United States. Um, you know, lots of people drink alcohol. Relatively few become alcoholic. It's tragic when it happens, and we deal with it when it happens. Our drug problem is not people using drugs, uh, the, the, the large number, relatively large number of people who use the drugs. It is the relatively small number of people who become dependent on them. And it is hard to imagine, for most of us, I know from all the propaganda we've heard, it's hard to imagine somebody enjoying a little heroin or a little methamphetamine or a little cocaine now and then and not becoming an addict. But it happens all the time. And the government figures that you can look at on drug use show it. You know, lots of Americans use these drugs and, almost, and very, very few use them even monthly, let alone daily. We don't think of somebody who drinks alcohol once a month as being an alcoholic. Um, so our actual drug problem is tiny and manageable. We don't need to lock up millions of people, disenfranchise millions of people, trash everybody's civil liberties to deal with that problem. Dan Baum, our guest, who wrote an article for Harper's Magazine, you can find it at harpers.org, called Legalize It, How to Win the War on Drugs. Two more things we want to get to here. I know we're short on time. And that is, um, you say we're at a time and place where both political parties, there might be a time for a change in all of this? Yes. Why? Uh, Well, Democrats have long critiqued the the drug war as being racist, putting too many people in prison, trashing civil liberties. Um, And the right um, traditionally uh, objects to wasteful government spending, government overreach into people's lives. Um, You can make a conservative argument to end the drug war and a a quote-unquote liberal argument to end the drug war. Both sides could be persuaded to listen to this. Um, It would probably have to be a Republican who did it, like it was going to be Nixon who went to China. Um, But um, 
you know, because Democrats have used the drug war to protect their right flank. No Democrat wants to look, quote unquote, soft on drugs. So right. Probably not going to be a Democrat. Who, who lowers the battle flag in the war on drugs. It will probably have to be a Republican. But this, this could happen. Uh, the country is going through a heroin epidemic, whether it's prescription drugs, whether it's street heroin or anything in between. You point out in your article all sorts of places all around the world that have decriminalized it and, quote-unquote, legalized it, and things are much better because they legalize these these very very dangerous drugs. Yeah, I mean, there, look, there's a smart way to do something, and there's a dumb way to do something. And the smart way is to say this is a health problem, and when somebody falls into addiction, we give them treatment. We don't put them in prison, right? We treat them. We reintegrate them back into society as quickly as possible. And if we're not spending all this money on enforcement and all the terrible violence and corruption that goes with it. Um, we, we can provide treatment, we can provide education, you know, we can manage this the way we would manage a flu epidemic and, um, and not be punitive, not drive people away. When, when, when these drugs are illegal, addicts are not going to present themselves for treatment because they're afraid of going to jail. Uh, so, you know, we're stuck on stupid, as they say in New Orleans, and we need to get off it. You mentioned, you mentioned Portugal. Did Portugal legalize heroin? No. Portugal decriminalized all drugs, which means the, the possession of small amounts and the use of these drugs is not a crime. The reason, and decriminalization is a popular idea. You know, it says, you know, lay off the, the users, stop locking people up for small amounts, you know, but continue to go after the gangs that, that s import and sell and push these drugs. The problem with that is, is that it doesn't get the job done because people still have to go to criminals to get their drugs. And you still have these big organized criminal networks. You still have to do that gunned up enforcement on that side of things. It, it, it's, it's an improvement. Portugal, what Portugal did is an improvement. By the way, it's a rousing success. Drug dependence went down. Teenage use went down. Nobody in Portugal argues for going back to the old way. But it's, it's a halfway measure that does not get the job done. You know, we, I should also say that the term legalize is incomplete. Really, we should say legalize and regulate because you, nobody advocates, not me, nobody I've met, advocates for just saying one day to the next, all right, all these drugs are legal. You have to manage, you have to regulate how they are distributed. I personally would argue for state monopoly of distribution. Um, other people say, no, a regulated free market will work just fine. Um, we have some uh, experience with alcohol. We have some states where the states run the liquor stores and other states where private companies run the liquor stores. And there are differences in drunk driving deaths and alcoholism, the, the, the States where there are where there is state monopoly, things work better. Um, you can adjust the price of these substances more easily because you, you just set the price. You don't have to do it with a tax. Taxes take a long time to pass. It's very hard to raise taxes. Very easy to lower them. Um, anyway, there's that's 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 a complicated issue. Sure. But the point is. We really should be saying legalize and regulate, not uh, just legalize. Is there a country, uh, Dan Baum, writer of an article in Harper's called Legalize It All, How to Win the War on Drugs, is there a country that is doing it more right, more right than, than, than Portugal out there? I would say maybe not a country, but I would say if you want to see how this could really work well, go to Colorado and look at marijuana. I'm from Colorado, and it is... It's an amazing thing to see. Um, you walk into a store, you're carded, um, so they know you're, you're old enough, and you buy marijuana like a gentleman. And your crime has gone down. Actually, teenage use has gone down because it no longer has a cachet. It's no, you're no longer being transgressive if you smoke pot. So teenagers are less interested in smoking it. Um, uh, Colorado has, uh, you know, there's... Colorado has legalized and regulated marijuana in a pretty intelligent way, and they deserve a lot of credit for it. Um, is it perfect? No. 
It's a new system. They're still ironing out the bugs. There have been problems. Um, they'll be the first to admit it. Um, I, you know, it's, it's, it, it's in the hands of private distributors. I think it would have been better if the state had taken it over. But Colorado works pretty well, and uh, it, it's a good object lesson. Um, there is a difference between heroin and marijuana. Uh, but with that being said... Heroin or prescription drugs is regulated. You have to go to a doctor to get it. Then you have to go to a pharmacist to get it. Right. That you doesn't still have a prescription drug problem. Right. Don't? That doesn't seem to be working. Well, it, you say it doesn't seem to be working. Um, would you say that our alcohol distribution system doesn't seem to be working because there are drunk drivers and their teenagers occasionally get alcohol? No. No system is perfect. Um, what we can do is better. We can't do perfect, and there are, we, there's a, there are a lot of lessons from around the world of how to handle heroin. In, in Switzerland, addicts can come in and get a shot you know, from a clean needle in a supervised environment. They know the dosage they're getting. They're not overdosing. They, they, can, they receive counseling. Um, they can eventually perhaps be weaned off the drug. There are ways we could do this if we were willing to lay down our punitive nature, and treat this, treat people dependent on drugs with compassion instead of contempt, and treat this whole thing as a matter of public health instead of law enforcement. Really interesting. Dan Baum, the writer of an article in Harper's Magazine, uh, the April uh, issue, also harpers.org, it's fantastic, called Legalize It All, How to Win the War on Drugs. Dan Baum, thank you for your time. Thank you. You got it. 926 here, Big